Welcome to Hollowed Ground Storycast. I'm Alan. And I'm Anya, and this episode is about the closest thing that I have to a holy text, the book Tiny Beautiful Things by Cheryl Strayed. If I believed in God, I'd see evidence of his existence in that. In your darkest hour, you were held aloft by the human love that was given to you when you needed it most. So I think this is the closest thing to a joint selection that we've covered on the show since Buffy. Um, Because I think this book means almost as much to you, if not more, than it does to me. Um, And actually, I think we've both kind of been avoiding this episode for a while because it is so personal. So, um, you know, it kind of feels like there's just a lot of weight on this. Yeah, I've read this book a bunch of times, but I had never heard of it before you had picked it. This was like one of the earliest things that you put in the we might talk about this pile for the show. And I was like, what is that? And and then I read it and I was like, this would change my life. Um, <laughs> yeah, like I said, I think this is the the closest thing to a holy text. And, and by that, I mean, like a book that has like a combination of narrative and philosophy and I think can really be used as like a set of guiding principles for how to morally live your life. That's really well put. Um, what is the plot of this book? <laughs> <laughs> plot is an interesting word for this book. Um, Tiny Beautiful Things is a collection of advice columns written by quote unquote sugar Um, who was the persona adopted by author Cheryl Strayed. They originally appeared on the Rumpus website before being edited into this book. And unlike most advice columns, uh, Dear Sugar is written in a highly personal and literary style, and the book also functions as a memoir of sorts for Strayed. Uh, The book is filled with radical empathy and honesty, and it's not afraid to stare into the face of some of the hardest things that people face. Things like sexual assault, child abuse, infidelity, heartbreak, addiction, and grief. Um, So just a content warning that we're going to be talking about a lot of hard things today. Um, And I guess we'll try and give kind of like minor content warnings before we hit anything super explicit. Um, But if you're feeling delicate, maybe this is not the episode for you. Or maybe you'll just want to skip some parts of it. Um, And then I also think it's interesting, you know, like we talked about before, this was one of the first things that I put on the list of of things to talk about for this podcast. Um, But just a couple weeks ago, Cheryl Strayed announced that she's restarting the column in the form of a newsletter. Um, I think previously um, it had been a podcast for a while. Um, So uh, we will have links to all of that stuff in the show notes if you're interested in following up. I mean, this is like a joint pick this time, but you were the one that put it on the list. So like, how did you find this book without having a podcast partner say this is a really good book, the way that a normal person would find this book? (laughs) Um. My roommate actually loaned the book to me after she read it and really loved it. And I was just coming out of a breakup of someone that I had been dating for almost seven years, like basically my whole adulthood at that point. Um, And so I was understandably like very upset and, you know, like my whole life was kind of in flux um, and like feeling very unstable. Um, And so this like, incredibly vulnerable book found me at an incredibly vulnerable point in my life. And it was really exactly what I needed. I read the whole thing and I had this kind of like, I don't know, like transcendental experience with the book. And I honestly didn't read it again for a long time. Um, because it was just kind of too much, you know? I had, like, had this amazing experience with the book. It was, like, super emotional. Uh, and I just wasn't really ready to revisit that. So even though I, like, bought cup- copies of the book and gave it to friends and, like, recommended it to other people, I actually didn't reread the book until 
about seven years later, actually, um, wow. um, when we just reread it recently for um, the book club that we do together. That was like a pretty that the book club that you mentioned too was like a pretty powerful experience all on its own. It was like, yeah, well, <laughs> a and whole it, nother thing too. Cause in the book club, it's not that we necessarily like stray away from mentioning personal things, you know, like we, we been through some shit together. Um, right. So there is like a, a definite like trust and intimate friendship and, and trauma bonding in that group to some extent. But this book is on a whole nother level, right? I think a lot of people in the book club were like, I don't know how to discuss this book without it just devolving into therapy. Um, <laughs> and yeah. th- and that's like kind of what this book is, honestly. Like I can imagine that, that writing it for Cheryl Strayed was a lot like therapy. And I think reading it is also a lot like therapy. Yeah, it's, man, I don't think it's just about, you know, like crazy life experiences and how to get through them and stuff there's like a core part of the book that's like about art and especially about writing Mm -hmm. Um, yeah and like how to be a writer and an artist which for strayed and i i think for like all of the greatest writers who write about writing it's about like being able to synthesize your experiences and be vulnerable and honest about them and like put that out there in a fearless way and then like once you're reading that and you're like in a group that you know the way our group works it's basically like a discord chat and so we're writing about this experience and so we're writing and she's like giving this advice about writing and about being vulnerable and so we were just all being vulnerable writers in there and it was yeah it was powerful yeah I think your point about it not Like, the book isn't just about trauma, you know, like, part of it is about trauma, but part of it is about art and living and the good parts of life as well. That is another aspect of the book that makes it feel kind of holy, because it's, it's really like trying to cover the whole spectrum of human existence, or maybe not even trying. I think it's kind of like effortlessly doing that (laughs) without trying. You know, because like if if you set out with that as your goal, there's no way you would possibly succeed. Um, but just yeah. by like being her full authentic self, Strayed manages to do that. You've kind of talked about this a little bit already, um, but do you? Is there anything else you want to share about your first experience reading this book? I don't even know if I remember the exact first time because I think I've read the book man I don't even know maybe like 10 11 times I remember thinking right away that the book is like you said you had like a holy kind of religious experience with it and uh, I definitely feel like it's a spiritual masterpiece I don't know another way to say that it's definitely not like a religious text or anything it doesn't like directly talk about God or like you should believe this or you know stuff like that it's not like that but I think that it's basically like a very sophisticated spiritual manual for modern existentialism like how do you live according to your personal conscience yeah you're super right and I think that is really key to a lot of the advice that she gives I mean some of the advice I think she would give no matter what but a lot of times People will write in and say, you know, like, here's my problem. Here's the thing I'm trying to decide. Like, what do you think I should do? And Sugar will say, here is what you should do. But know that this advice is not coming from me. This is actually coming from you. And like, here are all the things in your letter that told me why this is the right decision for you specifically. Yeah, exactly. She is like holding up a mirror to them because sometimes like you write stuff out and you just can't see yourself, but it's so clear. Like it's so clear what you're saying because it's not like she is a trained psychologist or anything, you know, like advice columnists in newspapers and stuff like that are like preeminently qualified people, right? Even, even if they're anonymous, they've got like 
Bonafidos, right? But this was like a blog in the early days of the internet and she was anonymous. She was a writer and Mm -hmm. she, you know, she gave advice like a writer and that is like be reflective, you know? Yeah. And she was actually the second person to inhabit the personality of Sugar. Sugar number one was very short lived. um, And obviously Cheryl Strayed super eclipsed um, that first person. (laughs) So this is a hard book to talk about compared to a lot of the things that we cover because it doesn't have a single narrative. I think we're going to kind of bounce around a little bit, and I think we're going to read more from the book than we normally do. And I thought it would be interesting to start with the introduction. It's written by uh, Steve Almond, who I think Cheryl hosts a podcast with, who was the original Sugar himself. And his introduction is just like, it completely articulates exactly how I feel about the book. So there's a section that I wanted to read about that from the introduction. Um, So this is not Sugar. This is Steve Almond and trigger warning for sexual assault and child abuse in this section. So um, if you don't want to hear that, you can just skip ahead about um, 30 seconds. The column that launched Sugar as a phenomenon was written in response to what would have been, for anyone else, a throwaway letter. Dear Sugar, wrote a presumably young man, WTF, WTF, WTF. I'm asking this question as it applies to everything, every day. Cheryl's reply began as follows. Dear WTF, my father's father made me jack him off when I was three and four and five. I wasn't any good at it. My hands were too small, and I couldn't get the rhythm right, and I didn't understand what I was doing. I only knew I didn't want to do it. Knew that it made me feel miserable and anxious in a way so sickeningly particular that I can feel that same particular sickness rising this very minute in my throat. It was an absolutely unprecedented moment. Advice columnists, after all, adhere to an unspoken code. Focus on the letter writer, dispense the necessary bromides, make it all seem bearable. Disclosing your own sexual assault is not part of the code. But Cheryl wasn't just trying to shock some callow kid into greater compassion. She was announcing the nature nature of her mission as sugar. Inexplicable sorrows await all of us. That was her essential point. Life isn't some narcissistic game you play online. It all matters. Every sin, every regret, every affliction. As proof, she offered an account of her own struggle to reckon with the cruelty she'd absorbed before she was old enough even to understand it. Ask better questions, sweet pea, she concluded with great gentleness. The fuck is your life? Answer it. Mm. Um, And then he also said something that I feel like (laughs) I struggle with every time I try to talk about this book to someone. Um, He says, with each of her pieces, I hesitate to use the word columns, which seem to cheapen what she does. She performs the same miraculous act. She absorbs our stories. She lets them inhabit her and thinks about the stories they evoke from her own life. And yeah, I just find the word column, like calling these advice columns is a little bit insulting in a way or just like doesn't really capture what's going on. It's weird because it is like part of that early time in the internet when, you know, like who knows if we can make money off this thing. Nobody knows how to do anything. On the one hand, there's like this posturing of traditional legitimate media. So there's like an idea of like, we'll do an advice column. People like that, right? That'll get clicks. But then at the same time, there's this like amateurization of culture that is happening because of the internet where you know like the internet's full of like amateur writers amateur musicians we're amateur broadcasters as we're doing this podcast you know what i mean like you're not qualified or studied to do it you do it in a radically different way that makes it something different like this is not a radio show that would work on the radio (laughs) you know what we do but it is an audio broadcast, but it's like a radically different thing, right? And it's it's not right to call it an internet radio show because that's not what it is. And she didn't write an advice column. She It's something different. Yeah, that's very astute. I don't know what it is, but like whatever it is, it's this book. I think um, she just created her own genre. 
Yeah. It is like it's a beautiful thing. Literary spiritual advice columns. <laughs> yeah. When we were doing the um the book club version of this, I had talked about Taoism like incessantly. Um I was going back over our comments and stuff last night. Um and I was like, wow, I am so tedious. Uh <laughs> and But I do, like, the more you talk about this, like, I again, I just see so much Taoism in her approach. I don't think that she, like, read the Tao Te Ching and she was like, yeah, this is how you do it. But more that the Tao Te Ching is just, like, in a groove with this thing. Because, like, what it says in there is the master, that's what it always calls the, like, hypothetical person that you're trying to be. They're like, they're like a mirror Mm. that... And they hold up to the other person what they are. That is what the the Taoist master does. And that is like her way to give advice. She doesn't tell them what to do. She just shows them what they want to do. Yeah. And it's amazing. Like that's really hard to do, I think. Exactly. And I, I well, I think uh, the kids these days would call that like she's vibing with the Tao teaching. <laughs> yeah. Uh, glad to be the the voice of youth on on this podcast. <laughs> Before, or maybe as a way to dive in to some of the the pieces, I can start with she is not afraid to use symbolism and symbols. Um, I think that's part of what gives the book its very literary feel. The way that she uses symbolism in the book really reminds me a lot of like going to a tarot reading Mm. um or at least Mm -hmm. the way that tarot i mean like in no by no means a tarot expert so if you are (laughs) take what i'm saying with a grain of salt but like from my uh like few experiences with it and and talking to people who do use it it's tarot is not like fortune telling it's not like you don't ask the cards like what is going to happen to me tomorrow and then flip the card it's more about like putting up a mirror, kind of like you said, like it presents you a symbol and then you get to assign the meaning to that symbol. And it's basically like an opportunity to interrogate your own life and experiences. And it helps you make meaning for yourself. Mm -hmm. So one of my favorite pieces in the book is actually like entirely built around this like real life experience that she had that kind of becomes a symbol for a lot more. So the piece is called There's a Bundle on Your Head. The symbol involved is basically that while Cheryl is working at this like really shitty job, she meets this woman and kind of like befriends her on the street, I think when she's like taking a cigarette break and and like forms this rapport with this woman. And then one day her husband comes and meets her and this woman comes by. And then after the woman leaves, he's like, oh my God, did you see the bundle on her head? And she was like, what? What are you talking about? And realizes that this woman had had this like huge bundle on her head every time she came by. And Cheryl was just like, not really perceiving or processing that, that it was like kind of a, a super like weird thing about her that she was willfully ignoring in the story it becomes a symbol for other things that we have in our lives that we are purposefully ignoring um it's basically becomes a symbol of denial but like unconscious denial yeah unconscious denial yeah Yeah, exactly and so i think as a reader when you're reading that story it really like makes you think about yourself like what are the head bundles in my life that I am like unconsciously ignoring. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think both of the times that I've read this book, I have definitely had different bundles um, that have been the things in my life that it's like on some subconscious level I know are there, but I'm not letting myself like fully think about um, or like fully acknowledge. And so you can't really address them until you're willing to acknowledge that they're there. Yeah, because she had to literally have someone else pointed out to her. Mm -hmm. And then, like, the absurdity of it 
hit her. Because the lady is like, to be clear, this lady is like homeless that she's talking to. Yeah, like definitely a destitute living a non-traditional life. She carries her stuff around and it's like in a big stack, you know, bundled up um, or some of her stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and so but she was like so starved for any genuine human connection. This is like she looked forward to talking to this lady every day because they could have a conversation because everyone at her job was a fucking asshole was terrible who, who yeah. didn't treat her like a human <laughs> on one level you know it's sweet because like she didn't care that this lady was like had some kind of mental illness or something but on the other hand it was like she's not seeing the stuff and like a big part of her like her life was in a huge crisis uh, and she couldn't clearly see that i mean i think all books do this to some extent, right? It shouldn't just be a passive experience of you absorbing the book, right? Like when you read any book, you make the meaning out of it. Um, and there should be some kind of like interaction going on. Um, but this mm-hmm. book is because it's like her interacting with the letter writers and then you interacting with the text. It's like this very interesting kind of like almost three-way interaction. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Which, again, is, like, it's a lot like therapy, right? Like, you don't... When you go to therapy, your therapist doesn't do the work. You're the one doing the work. Um, I think (laughs) in order to read this book, it, like, really takes a lot of work. (laughs) But not in a bad way. It can be, like, emotionally draining, but also, like, ultimately refilling. Cathartic, yeah. 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 But it can also be, like, her husband at the time pointing that out. And, like, maybe you will see something and be, like... I don't want to look at that, you know? Yeah. There's like, there's stuff there about being homeless. And I've never really talked on this podcast. I don't think on any podcast about a time in my life when I was homeless. It was a similar kind of thing. Like I left my home area, whatever, like where I went to high school and then went to college. Like I traveled across the country and took all my shit with me and, um, committed to an unstable job and then lost that job in a economy that was like very sharply like on the one hand there are some of the richest people on earth here and on the other hand there are all the people who serve them and um I pissed off one of the really rich powerful people and so I could not get a job anywhere and I and the place where I lived is where I also worked. Like having a place to live was because I worked there. I um, see. And so it was like, you don't work here anymore, so you don't live here anymore. I see. Because service people could not afford to live in that area other way, uh, in any other way. Yeah, exactly. And it was like, I, to be clear, I worked in a hotel and it was like a seasonal type job. And part of the hotel was like, you know, Every hotel room, four or five service people who work at that hotel live there. It was so weird because on one level, I became much less anxious than I had ever been before in my life because this was it. Like there was nothing else to worry about. When I woke up every day, it was like, what am I going to eat today? And that was the only thing to worry about um, because I couldn't. I couldn't get out of there. I was literally like in the mountains um, in the middle of nowhere. My car had been repossessed and like I had no way to leave. I didn't have any money to get out of there. And so it was just a matter of finding food every day. And um, that was kind of a simple problem to solve. And then it was like, where am I going to sleep? And that was it. And I didn't have to worry about like, what's my future going to be? Is this person in love with me? Am I in love with that person? Does this make me a bad person? Like none of that shit existed anymore. And it was, um, it was just survival. But also like there was a lot of trauma happening that it was a bundle on my head. Like I did not understand how, like I was dying, (laughs) you know, like I was losing weight um, in a dangerous way and like getting sick and doing bad damage to myself on multiple levels. And only years after I left that situation and like looked back at it, was I like, wow, that, that was a very 
traumatic, dangerous, scary experience in my life that for a, a long time I believed was a good thing that had happened to me, but it was like very much a bundle on my head for a long time until someone pointed out to me that like I see and not until I saw it as trauma was I like oh (laughs) yeah for me I feel like the first time I read this book the bundle was like that my relationship was failing and I was Mm. totally in denial about it because I I was just only seeing things from my perspective um and there were just like so many warning signs in retrospect. And I guess I'll talk more about that later when we get to um, another piece that kind of speaks to that same situation. Um, but then it's interesting when we, when I reread the book again earlier this year, this time as I was reading it, I was like, oh, the bundle is that one of my friend's relationships is failing. He isn't quite willing to accept that mm-hmm. yet. Mm-hmm. And like at some point, he is going to suddenly see the bundle (laughs) and really have to reckon with it. Like, you know, on one level you'd be like, oh, you should always, you should like try to see the bundle or something. But like you, I don't think you can. I don't even think it's good to sometimes. No, like sometimes you're not ready to see it until you do. And then it's like, you feel stupid (laughs) because you're like, why didn't I see it sooner? Like it was so obvious but like you have to you have to be gentle with yourself and cut yourself some slack that that like not seeing the bundle is is sometimes part of human nature and like sometimes you don't see it until you're ready to see it and then do something about it. Yeah, exactly. And it can be a long time sometimes like I said with the whole homeless thing because I think if I had understood at that time, the kind of serious damage that it was doing to me on like multiple levels, that would not have been helpful for getting out of the situation. You know what I mean? Like there was a reason that my psyche was like, just going to put this over here where Mm -hmm. you can't look at it right now. And we're just going to focus on getting something to drink and eat today. I mean, and she does that over and over in these uh, answers to the letters where they, you know, if you're going to talk about it in a religious way, they kind of operate like um, parables almost, you know, everything is symbolic, but they do come from her real lived experience. So while we're kind of already on the topic, I guess I will move to talking about the other piece that really spoke to me the first time in the aftermath of my breakup The piece is called The Truth That Lives There. And what this piece did for me, I think, it finally, like, crystallized just that the relationship was over because it let me really see the relationship from my partner's point of view. I guess it let me accept that he both loved me and could not be with me at the same time. And that even though those two things can sound like contradictions, they don't necessarily have to be. In this piece, Cheryl, or Sugar, Cheryl Sugar, um, has, there's letters from three different women um, who are basically all in relationships where things seem kind of good, but they also are just like hesitating or feeling like really conflicted about it for some reason. Um, And so I just wanted to read a little bit because Cheryl responds basically by telling the story about her and her ex-husband. And again, it's funny that like (laughs) the bundle on her head was also, was like her and her ex-husband. And then this one is also about her and her ex-husband. So she says, There was nothing wrong with my ex-husband. He wasn't perfect, but he was pretty close. I met him a month after I turned 19, and I married him on a rash and romantic impulse a month before I turned 20. He was passionate and smart and sensitive and handsome and absolutely crazy about me. I was crazy about him too, though not absolutely. He was my best friend, my sweet lover, my guitar-strumming, political rabble-rousing, road-tripping sidekick, the co-proprietor of our vast and eclectic music and literature collection, and daddy to our two darling cats. But there was in me an awful thing from almost the very beginning, 
a small clear voice that would know no matter what I did, stop saying go. Go even though you love him. Go even though he's kind and faithful and dear to you. Go even though he's your best friend and you're his. Go even though you can't imagine your life without him. Go even though he adores you and your leaving will devastate him. Go, even though your friends will be disappointed or surprised or pissed off or all three. Go, even though you once said you would stay. Go, even though you're afraid of being alone. Go, even though you're sure no one will ever love you as much as he does. Go, even though there is nowhere to go. Go, even though you don't know exactly why you can't stay. Go, because you want to. Because wanting to leave is enough. Get a pen, write that last sentence on your palm, all three of you, then read it over and over again until your tears have washed it away. Mm. It just like gave me a sense of peace about it that I hadn't had up until that point. Because up until I read this, I had been like looking for the answer to have it make logical sense or to try and like reconcile these these like two apparently contradicting things and 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 this was it gave me permission to be like it doesn't matter like there is no logic there is no way to reconcile these two things wanting to leave me was enough mm-hmm. it just like it really helped me accept it i mean I, obviously like i don't know if this is for sure but like my impression at the time right was that Um, that he was conflicted, right? And that leaving me was not easy. But this made me feel like he'd done the right thing for him and made me, like, proud of him in a way. (laughs) It helps me empathize with him and, like, get outside of myself in a way that I hadn't been able to before. And then I did... I just wanted to read another section from the end of this. It's just, like, so beautifully written. I didn't want to stay with my ex-husband, not at my core, even though whole swaths of me did. And if there's one thing I believe more than I believe anything else, it's that you can't fake the core. The truth that lives there will eventually win out. It's a god we must obey, a force that brings us all inevitably to our knees. And because of it, I can only ask the three of you the same question. Will you do it later or will you do it now? Yours, Mm -hmm. Sugar. Yeah, so that is, like, (laughs) probably the single piece of writing that has had the biggest impact on my life ever. That's so cool that, like, you wanted a trigger for what, what did I do wrong? What is wrong about me that made this happen? And it was like, there was no trigger. That's what was in his core. This wasn't going to work. And then that, like, emancipated you from needing that. Yeah, exactly. I was not the letter writer there, right? I was like on the flip side. Um, right. Yeah, it, that's what's interesting. But it was very freeing nonetheless. Especially that last part where you're talking about the core and stuff, or I guess Sugar is talking about it, uh, again, is like so Taoist to me that that is like, that is the Tao, is like that core of you that the hardest thing is to listen to that thing. Mm-hmm. It's that's what the whole Tao Te Ching is about. There is some part of yourself that you cannot fight forever, or that if you do, you'll be very unhappy. Um, mm-hmm. That there is some sort of like authentic version of yourself that you have to embrace on some level in order to feel fulfilled. Yeah, and like I said earlier, this is about like existentialism. And like why there are so many problems in the world, I think, because like it's like you said, you can't change that deep part of yourself. But sometimes living authentically to who you are will not fit into society. Mm -hmm. And because there's all these rules that are made up, you know, based on things that are not real and they don't correspond to what's in your core. And then that makes you some kind of enemy to the forces of authority in the world. You should not be attracted to people of the same sex, or you should only be in monogamous relationships, or you should, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. 
there is something that I wanted to read that's related like directly to the thing that you just read too, that, um, you know, like go, 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 go. That list is so good. Uh, and I'm sure that it's like emancipated a lot of people in different ways, but it talks about that core and it's not an answer to a letter or anything like that in the book. It's actually a part of the book. You would only see it in the book if you have the book. Anyway, and in the beginning of part five, she talks about her approach to how she answers questions, how she gives advice. And I won't say it as beautifully as she says it in the audiobook version, which she reads herself, and I highly recommend to everybody who likes audiobooks. Don't do what you know on a gut level to be the wrong thing to do. Don't stay when you know you should go or go when you should stay. Don't fight when you should hold steady or hold steady when you should fight. Don't focus on the short-term fun instead of the long-term fallout. Don't surrender all your joy for an idea you used to have about yourself that isn't true anymore. Don't seek joy at all costs. I know it's hard to know what to do when you have conflicting sets of emotions and desires, but it's not as hard as we pretend it is. Saying it's hard is ultimately a justification to do whatever seems like the easiest thing to do. Have the affair, stay at that horrible job, end a friendship over a slight, keep loving someone who treats you terribly. I don't think there's a single dumbass thing I've done in my entire adult life that I didn't know was a dumbass thing to do while I was doing it. (laughs) Even when I justified it to myself, as I did every damn time, The truest part of me knew that I was doing the wrong thing, always. As the years pass, I'm learning how to better trust my gut and not do the wrong thing. But every so often, I get a harsh reminder that I've still got work to do. I love that so much. And I especially love the humility of admitting that she's made mistakes and that she makes bad decisions and that she doesn't always listen to her authentic core um because it's so different i feel like again like a lot of advice columns they come from that position of authority of like i know what's best and i think the implication there is that i don't fuck up i don't make mistakes Mm -hmm. um sugar's moral authority doesn't come from not making mistakes it comes from making mistakes and having learned and that is like a much deeper Um, and more empathetic type of wisdom but it's like super hard to do and she and she gives that too she's like i know it's hard sweet pea but Mm -hmm. yeah shame and fear they're like unavoidable parts of life she just presents a really interesting way of of kind of like looking at them and using them but not letting them rule your life Mm -hmm. um i guess on the the subject of fear That might be a good transition into uh, my third favorite piece in the book. So this is one of the pieces that is more about, um, like, art than trauma. Um, And it also has become, uh, like, somewhat of a a symbol for, like, the Deer Sugar Project. Um, They have, like, mugs and stuff for sale that say, um, write like a motherfucker, which I'm actually drinking my tea out of right now. Um, cause I, so again, I read this while I was, um, getting my PhD in grad school and this really spoke to me. Um, so the, the, the original letter is by an aspiring author struggling with actually writing and is being kind of ruled by fear. Um, so the letter writer says, I'm a high-functioning headcase, one who jokes enough that most people don't know the truth. The truth. I am sick with panic that I cannot, will not, override my limitations, insecurities, jealousies, and ineptitude to write well with intelligence and heart and lengthiness. And I fear that even if I do manage to write, that the stories I write about my vagina, femininity, etc. will be disregarded and mocked. Yeah. So Sugar shares a lot of her struggles writing her first book and trying to become a writer um, when she says 
I believed I'd wasted my 20s by not having come out of them with a finished book, and I bitterly lambasted myself for that. I thought a lot of the same things about myself that you do, that I was lazy and lame, that even though I had the story in me, I didn't have it in me to see it to fruition, to actually get it out of my body and onto the page. But I'd finally reached a point where the prospect of not writing a book was more awful than the one of writing a book that sucked, and so at last I got to serious work on the book. When I was done writing it, I understood that things happened just as they were meant to, that I couldn't have written my book before I did. I simply wasn't capable of doing so, either as a writer or a person. To get to the point I had to get to write my first book, I had to do everything I did in my 20s. I had to write a lot of sentences that never turned into anything, and stories that never miraculously formed a novel. I had to read voraciously and compose exhaustive entries in my journals. I had to waste time and grieve my mother and come to terms with my childhood and have stupid and sweet and scandalous sexual relationships and grow up. In short, I had to gain the self-knowledge that Flannery O'Connor mentions in that quote I wrote on my chalkboard. And once I got there, I had to make a hard stop at self-knowledge's first product, humility. Do you know what that is, sweet pea? To be humble? The word comes from the Latin words humilis and humus, to be down low, to be of the earth, to be on the ground. That's where I went when I wrote the last word of my first book, straight onto the cool tile floor to weep. I sobbed and I wailed and I laughed through my tears. I didn't get up for half an hour. I was too happy and grateful to stand. I had turned 35 a few weeks before. I was two months pregnant with my first child. I didn't know if people would think my book was good or bad or horrible or beautiful, and I didn't care. I only knew I no longer had two hearts beating in my chest. I pulled one out with my own bare hands. I suffered. I'd given it everything I had. I'd finally been able to give it because I'd let go of all the grandiose ideas I'd once had about myself in my writing. So talented, so young. I'd stopped being grandiose. I'd lowered myself to the notion that the absolute only thing that mattered was getting that extra beating heart out of my chest, which meant I had to write my book. My very possibly mediocre book. My very possibly never going to be published book. My absolutely nowhere in league with the writers I'd admired so much that I practically memorized their sentences book. It was only then, when I humbly surrendered, that I was able to do the work I needed to do. You need to do the same, dear, sweet, arrogant, beautiful, crazy, talented, tortured, rising star glow bug. That you're so bound up about writing tells me that writing is what you're here to do. And when people are here to do that, they almost always tell us something we need to hear. I want to know what you have inside you. I want to see the contours of your second beating heart. So write, not like a girl, not like a boy, write like a motherfucker. Um, and, <laughs> and that was like exactly the message that I needed to hear as I was like at the end of my PhD and trying to um you know wrap up years of research and just like get this damn thesis done and out the door um and so I like I bought the mug and every morning I would like wake up and drink my cup of coffee and I would just like write like a motherfucker and I got it done um and it was it just yeah it like that message of like it's about humility and it's about just getting it done and being willing to write something that's bad because you need to you have to write something and that the creation of the thing matters more than whether it's good because obsessing about whether it's good or not is paralyzing um, I think that's something that, like, almost every writer struggles with, um, but just, like, the way that she captures it, I think, is, is like, really inspiring. Yeah, it sounds hard. I've never dealt with it that at all. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> it's funny because, like, you were talking about fear earlier. There's, like, a really famous book about how to be a writer by Stephen King called On Writing. It's probably one of the most influential books on writers in the last 20 years. And he says the same thing. It's so funny, though, because, like, he says, like, you cannot write from fear and you have to be humble. And then he, like, gives examples of that in style where he talks about, like, what you should do when you write dialogue is say he said, she said, 
and not he shouted, she whispered, he said in a quavering voice. Because like the context of all of the prose should tell the reader that they're whispering or Mm -hmm. that they're scared or that they're shouting because like trust the reader that they understand the reason you're spoon feeding them is because you're afraid they won't get it. Stop being afraid. That makes you that like is holding your writing back. Uh, And, but then what everybody took from that was like, Oh, I should say he said, she said, um, (laughs) and that will make my writing good. And they took like all the style from it. But what I love about her advice is that she doesn't, do that right she keeps it like in a way he shouldn't have said that because like this is better advice um where she's like you need to write like a motherfucker like stop you have to i had to be on the ground i had to be broken and open and not worrying about my ego or what this would be or like you know, giving the interview to Terry Gross in my head about how amazing I am and how brilliant and, you know, like all of this bullshit and just do the thing, right? Like you Mm -hmm. had to do it. I think a PhD is actually way more traumatic than our society. Oh, oh, absolutely. For sure. There's a reason why. um, Actually, there's like a a lot of conversation going on right now about um, mental health in grad school um, because it's it's like so hard and and traumatic Um, the qualifying exam in my program was like so traumatic that people ended up being like hospitalized and having health problems and like having their hair fall out (laughs) Um, so they actually they thankfully revamped it before I got there Um, but when I was like a first year and a second year, there were people who were like fifth and sixth years in the program who were talking about how they had really been through hell. And thankfully, the department had kind of responded to their feedback to try and make it slightly less traumatic. And I I don't think that like the value of it comes from that trauma. And I don't think that that's what she's saying here, right? She's not saying like, I had to be traumatized to be a writer. She's saying that like all of that trauma that happened anyway added up to something Mm -hmm. you know like it's like getting jumped into a gang everybody's like well i had to go through it yeah oh my god so much of academia is just like hazing under another name hazing that's what i was trying it's really really shitty i can remember the first time that i wrote a book and how much i relate to what she says after i was homeless I got out of that situation and saved up some money and I had taken a break from college and I went to go back to college and finish out my creative writing degree. I was also like, you know, in my mid twenties and, uh, I was all messed up, but it was like, it doesn't like I'm perfect and good because like, uh, I'm in denial. Um, so Like, I was trying to figure shit out, but I was also um, not being reflective and dealing with any of my shit, which meant that when you do that, I think what ends up happening is you just make the same mistakes over again because, like, you haven't learned anything from the shit that has happened. And I've talked about before on the podcast, like, when we talked about Wild Seed and stuff, like, the house that I grew up in was not, like, nurturing or um, helpful. It was like abusive relationships. And I had not reckoned with that. And what ended up happening was I got myself into a romantic relationship with someone who was really abusive, uh, in, on like every level, uh, and did really bad things to me. And then, and and the way that this person was tied up in my life (laughs) ended up um, messing up my living situation in exactly like a mirroring of becoming homeless. Like I lived at the place that I worked when I was working at that hotel place. And this woman's boyfriend was my roommate. And she was like, having a thing with me on the side 
uh, which I was putting up with in a very like abusive way. And it was, of course, that's going to cause serious problems with your living situation. And then, you know, that was also putting all kinds of stress while I'm trying to like have a job and go to college and, you know, just be a 20 something person trying to do that. And, and what ended up happening was like the living situation became impossible. He ended up leaving, which, you know, made rent harder. She also ended up leaving. And when she left, like I had nothing like uh, now I had all these bills to pay. Um, all of this stress had like unraveled my ability to do schoolwork very well and, had thrown me into like a bad depression that I made poor choices at school and made people angry who made sure that like I would not be able to complete my degree. So like I just couldn't get my degree basically. And it was like, so school became a dead end. The relationship was a dead end. Uh, Home was very difficult to deal with. And so all that I had left was this story inside of me that had been in there for since I was like a little kid. I had been building it and building it and building it. And since I had nothing else, <laughs> I since I was on the ground, the way that she says, and there was no dream of a future. Like the future was gone. I wasn't going to graduate. I wasn't going to make anyone proud who believed in me or had backed me or helped me. I wasn't, no one was going to love me again, like obviously, because like everybody was so easily, had dumped me and left. I might as well just write this book and then die. (laughs) What else was left to do? And so I just stayed at home and wrote, and then I would just go to work when I absolutely had to go to work. And I would come home and write, and I wrote a whole huge, terrible book. But then when it was out of me, it like, it changed me. And it, it did feel like another life had come out of me. Like exactly like she says, that second heartbeat. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a kind of wholeness to it afterward. Um, and when that woman came back into my life, I was able to, to be like, no, and I'm not, no, this is, this is not happening. And, um, and I met the woman I'm married to now and like, uh, everything is perfect now. Um, but but you know what I mean? Like it's what she says that like, it wasn't going to get done with all of this drama or with all of the ideas that I had about what being a writer is or like, I couldn't be a writer if I couldn't go through that program and have a piece of paper that said, you're a creative writer. Like that was an idea in my head. Mm -hmm. Um, And then once it wasn't going to happen, I was like, well, then I sat down and wrote a book. (laughs) (laughs) Then I was a writer. You know what I mean? Like that's what makes you a writer. It's not some certification Yeah. And actually, on that topic, I feel like I said things like aspiring writer when I was talking about this before. And like, I believe um, in our friend Lonnie's idea that like, if you write, you're a writer, like, period, that's it. It doesn't matter if you're published or not. You don't have to use an adjective to soften like that. You get to claim being a writer if you write. That's it. But I think you do have to write. You can't be like this girl and be like, well, I can't write because, you know, I because I'm a woman, I will be dismissed or because I'm black. No one will listen to me or because or because or because because I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. But you do have to write. (laughs) Yeah. So this story reminded me of one of my other favorite pieces where she also uses etymology, I think, to make a very profound point The piece is called We Are All Savages Inside, Um, and the letter writer is a novelist um, who's friends with a bunch of novelists and is basically insanely jealous of all of her friends. And, like, every time one of her friends has a success, 
she gets really jealous of them um, and kind of like hates that about herself, but she just like can't bring herself to be genuinely happy for any of her friends success because she's just like bitterly upset that she hasn't gotten her book published yet. And Sugar says, you might, for example, be interested to know that the word prestigious is derived from the Latin prestigie, which means conjures tricks. Isn't that interesting? This word that we use to mean honorable and esteemed has its beginnings in a word that has everything to do with illusion, deception, and trickery. Does that mean anything to you, awful jealous person? Because when I found that out, every tuning fork inside of me went hum. Could it be possible that the reason you feel like you swallowed a spoonful of battery acid every time someone else gets what you want is because a long time ago, very back in your own very beginnings, you were sold a bill of goods about the relationship between money and success, fame and authenticity, legitimacy and adulation. I think it's worth investigating. Doing so will make you a happier person and also a better writer, I know without a doubt. Good luck selling your novel. I sincerely hope you get six figures for it. When you do, write to me and share the wonderful news. I promise to be over the moon for you. Yours, Sugar. It's so it's so good. It's exactly the same kind of thing, too, as what I was talking about, getting a piece of paper, and now I'm a writer. Because with her, it's like getting published and getting a six-figure deal, and now I'm real. There's like some kind of outside validation. And she, and she tells her the same thing. She's, no, you have to write like a motherfucker. <laughs> That's what makes you a writer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm trying to remember when this book was published. I should <laughs> I should have looked that up and put it at the beginning. Um, so it was published in 2012. I think it was a li- slightly before the concept of privilege was quite so well known in the mainstream. Um, but I think this column in particular is like a great explanation or exploration of of like privilege and entitlement and how those things can all get wrapped together and like warp us in ways that we're not necessarily aware of. Yeah. In her response, she again, she's not like giving her some kind of moral set of rules and saying, here's why you're bad. She's holding up a mirror and saying, why is it that you felt the need to say that you went to a prestigious school? What is a prestigious school? What does it mean about you that you went there? What kind of people don't go to a prestigious school? What does their education mean? And like, these are not rhetorical questions. You need to think about what those are. Because a lot of your jealousy is coming from your warped point of view on what the world owes you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And actually, I think some of the most interesting conversations that we had in our book club about this book were all about education and like, what is the meaning of of education and how does that relate to art and like our self-conception of ourself Um, because there's a really amazing um, piece where um, Cheryl Strayed writes what is essentially like a commencement address for like a small creative writing program um, and talks about um, when her mom got an honorary PhD and that's like one of the parts of the book that like really made me cry um, just because you know like I'm an educator and I've worked with all all different types of students, um, including in correctional facilities um, with different populations that like haven't had a lot of the same opportunities that I've had. And, and like I've seen what education can do as like an exercise that's like very disconnected from the paper that you get at the end. Um, and, and I think... Um, Sugar does a great job of like really nailing that. Yeah, I think because of the experience that I I talked about around my degree and stuff, I still have like anger and uh, a chip on my shoulder about academia and education. But I also have like strong feelings about like there should be some kind of law that 
at a minimum, we spend 50 cents on the dollar on education for all the money we spend on the military industrial complex, for example. It should yep. be one to one, but um, <laughs> we'll uh, aim reasonably in the middle. Yeah. Um, it just seems crazy to me. Like, why wouldn't we want? Well, I know why we wouldn't want people to be educated, but um, <laughs> but uh, it just seems dumb. Because like you said, because it, it, it changes their life. If we really wanted to like lower crime and, um, you know, empty out prisons and stuff like that, then that's what we would be doing because that's what changes people's lives, I think. But this book is about like how everything we do is education, if you let it be, um, mm-hmm. in that tarot card kind of way. If you're willing to like reflect on your experiences and kind of turn your life or allow your life to like be a piece of literature or a symbol, let your life become some kind of parable that teaches you something about yourself and about everybody else. But that can be, that takes work and it it takes, yeah, it's not easy, but it's really valuable though. Um, And I think that this book helps to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Having said that, I did want to like do one more quote from the book and what she has to say about like suffering and responsibility. Uh, I really like this quote or sometimes I really like it and other times I'm like, fuck off with this (laughs) quote. Um, But like not in a... (laughs) Not in a dismissive way, but like in a I can't do that right now way. Yeah. And a like you're right and it and I hate you because I know yeah. you're right kind of way. <laughs> yeah. I think this is the hardest thing, or it's the hardest thing for me, because I don't want it to be true. <clears throat> what she says is nobody will protect you from your suffering. You can't cry it away, or eat it away, or starve it away, or walk it away, or punch it away or even therapy it away. It's just there, and you have to survive it. You have to endure it. You have to live through it and love it and move on and be better for it and run as far as you can in the direction of your best and happiest dreams across the bridge that was built by your own desire to heal. (sighs) (laughs) And like, fuck off. Yeah. (laughs) But like, also, yes. Yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, it's stuff like that, that the, I think the book is like a spiritual masterpiece. There's a lot of insight in it. And in that tarot deck kind of way, like you said, I think you can go back to this book at different times in your life and read the same things over again and get something different out of it. Because what it's showing you is not like some kind of lesson, like some kind of here are three steps to doing this. It's holding up a mirror and you might see things about yourself or about people that you love or things that have happened to you or, you know, whatever the, you know, the book is not laying things out in a way that it's trying to teach you something. It's letting you teach yourself something. I think you're absolutely right about that. And, and one of the things that I found really interesting about reading this book in book club is that because we were, you know, reading a set amount each week, we read this book much more slowly over about 10 weeks um, Mm -hmm. than I had ever read it before. And I feel like I was a different person while we were doing that. And, and, for a couple months after that. Like, I feel like when I'm reading this book and meditating on it, I, it, like, it genuinely makes me a better, more empathetic, like, plugged in um, person. I'm, like, more self aware of what's going on with me. And I'm also, like, more tuned in to what other people around me are, are, like, feeling and doing. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so, Like, I don't know, in the same way that I think a lot of religious people do read, like, the Bible or the Quran every day, or at the very least, like, every week, 
as a way Mm -hmm. of kind of like keeping themselves centered and grounded. I feel like I would be a better person if I was just constantly running through this book in like mere, in the same way that like sugar is just meeting people where they are. Like reading that book makes me want to do that too for everybody. And I think like, especially in 2020, when like everything is going to hell in a handbasket and and like there's just so much hate and and like us versus them um i think it can be really easy to just like close off that part of yourself and this book really reminds me that like it is a higher calling to not do that to not close off that part of yourself mm-hmm. yeah i think you're exactly right about reading devotional scripture that way it's a practice of centering yourself mm-hmm. you know you should sign up for this newsletter i heard about from cheryl strayed oh i, I should <laughs> that will probably help oh yeah i feel like i should have mentioned this in the the introduction when i was talking about the book um but just kind of got distracted. Um, So Cheryl Strait, obviously she has the novel that we referenced. Um, She also has an actual memoir called Wild um, about hiking the Pacific Crest Trail um, in the wake of her mother's death. I think it's a bestseller um, and was turned into a movie where um, she was played by Reese Witherspoon. Um, So I haven't actually read that book or seen the movie, um, but I've heard they're good. And I feel like having Reese Witherspoon play you in a movie is, is definitely life goals. <laughs> right. Well, maybe, maybe as long as you're not like the villain, I guess. Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also if you've enjoyed our conversation today, I would just like definitely encourage you to pick up this book and read it. Um, there are over 50 pieces in the book. Um, and I, you know, we've, touched on less than 10 and there's like there's so much in here i think we talked about the ones that related most to our personal experience and the one that touched us the most but there's a lot in here it's hard to know what is necessarily going to resonate with you without picking up the book yourself um and like particularly there's some some pieces about um the grief of losing a parent and also the grief of losing a child. Um, and miscarriage that are just like incredibly powerful. Um, So if if those are things that you are dealing with or have dealt with in the past, I think um, that could be a really, a really great thing for you to to check out. It's got everything. I mean, there's stuff about like, should I have kids or about marriage? Oh, yeah. I definitely bookmarked that one. I was like, please revisit in three years. (laughs) (laughs) And there's funny stuff too. So yeah, it's it's got everything. Oh, there is one other thing that I wanted to say. Obviously, this has been a hugely important book to both of us. If you do take the time to get the book and to read it, we would love to hear from you about which pieces um, impacted you the most. And if you're comfortable sharing maybe a little bit more about that specific, you know, we always love to get feedback from listeners. Um, But I think specifically on this episode, because um, it is so personal um, and it is such like an interactive piece of media, if you have something to share, we'd love to hear from you. If we get enough responses, um, maybe we'll even put together um, a feedback episode um, where we um, share stories from different listeners um, and we're happy to do so anonymously if you're more comfortable with that. Um, I think this is the part of the podcast where um, we talk about how the thing has impacted us and whether we recommend it to other people. Um, But we've pretty much been talking about that nonstop. (laughs) Um, So I think we can just make a a break straight for the outro, um, unless you have anything else to say. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Um, Well, in that case, I do just want to make a brief announcement that I know we haven't been super consistent about this podcast um, because we've been, you know, focusing on other projects um, and also um, our own sanity in this wild, wild world of 2020. Um, But we are going on a more 
official and intentional break, um, at least for the next few months, um, because season two of His Dark Materials is coming out. Um, and so we will be covering that over on our podcast, Measures of Truth, um, with our additional co-hosts, Francis and Caitlin. Um, and then after that, season three of American Gods is coming out. And so we will be covering that over on our podcast, um, which is the two of us, Shadows and Shamblers. Um, we probably won't be back um, until at least, I want to say like March or April, maybe at the earliest of 2021. Um, hopefully we'll all be living in a very different world by that point. And so um, we're not exactly sure what that episode will be on, um, but if you're if you're interested and you want to keep up to date with us, follow us on social media, and we'll make sure to announce what the episode is going to be about um, before we post the episode itself. Meanwhile, if you like what we do, don't forget to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts. I'm Anya, and you can follow me on Twitter at Strangely Literal. That's strangely, then L-I-T-E-R-L. You can follow the show on Twitter at HG Storycast and visit our website at hgstorycast.com. And if you'd like to leave us feedback, you can visit hgstorycast.com slash contact or send an email to contact at hallowedgroundmedia.com. Hallowed Ground Storycast is a Hallowed Ground media production and is produced under a Creative Commons non-commercial share alike license.